Good morning, Fellowship Greenville. So good to see you inside when it's so messy outside. Uh, just a special thanks going out to our parking lot team who brave all kinds of weather. And so we're certainly grateful for them getting us in the building uh, without too much uh, water on us. But uh, anyway, I, I'm going to begin this morning by talking about uh, uh, some good news, some really good news. Um, as most of you know, we have uh, been kind of in a capital campaign of raising some funds to expand our ministry to the Adams Mill uh, YMCA, and um, we had about $9.23 million pledged and given as gifts so far. You know that in the month of January, we had kind of a first fruits offering uh, for those who could give as much as uh, towards their pledge as possible up front. And I'm pleased to announce this morning that we have received um, $3.2 million in advance pledges. So that means we can pay as we go for uh, quite a bit longer, and that's just so exciting. And I, w- I just want you to know how grateful for we-, we are for your generosity. You know, Jesus said, where your tr- tr- uh, heart is, there's your treasure. Where your treasure is, there's your heart. And so for you to give so generously, it, um, it's not lost on us that you, um, you treasure what God's doing here, and you've put your heart here, and we're so very grateful for that. If this is your first time with us, welcome. Uh, We're so glad you came uh, to worship with us today. There are a lot of great churches in Greenville, and the fact that you're here today is not something we take lightly. One of the things that we do want you to know about us is that if you attend here on a regular basis, most Sundays you'll find us teaching through whole books of the Bible. Sometimes we dig in and we go verse by verse. Uh, At other times, we fly over large sections of Scripture in order to get the big picture of how God works in the world and in our lives. And right now, we're in a study that we're called, that we're calling royalty. We're in royalty part two. Uh, We're working our way through the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel. And today, we're in 2nd Samuel 6, and we're looking at the life of Israel's greatest king, King David. Now, every so often as you're reading through the Bible, you come across a passage that shocks you or a story that offends your modern sensibilities, a story that makes you wonder if God is actually the God you think he is, a story that kind of shakes you to the core, and today we come to one of those stories. So let me begin by asking you this question, or a couple of questions. When was the last time that God left you confused? I see some smiles, maybe right now. Um, when was the last time you were mad at God? Like there was something that you thought God would, could, should do, uh, and he didn't do, and so it made you kind of angry. When was the last time... You found yourself looking at your life and thinking about God and you, thinking, what in the world is going on here? Could this really be the God that I placed my hope in? Could this really be the God that I have placed my trust in? Let me turn it around and maybe in a little bit more pointed way. When was the last time you brought God into the court of your own judgment? For many of us, at some point in our lives, we've all wrestled with those kinds of questions, and today we're going to see that King David, who was a man after God's own heart, he wrestled with questions like that as well. So if you're not there already, Second Samuel uh, chapter 6, paper or digital Bible's fine. I'm going to put most of the ver- verses up on the screen today. This is one of those what in the world is going on passages of Scripture. It's a passage that when you start reading through the verses, you think you know where the story is going, but you don't. Because the plot line takes a sharp turn and you're hit with, with shock and confusion. Now hear me. I think that's why it's in the Bible. The passage is meant to shock you, and maybe not for the reasons that you think, So follow along as I read 2 Samuel 6, 1 to 4. I am reading from the New Living Translation, the NLT, which, by the way, we like to use the NLT when we read the Bible stories found in the Old Testament and in the Gospels. 2 Samuel 6, verse 1, Then David again gathered all the elite troops in Israel, 30,000 in all, 
He led them to Baalah of Ju- Judah to bring back the ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the two cherubim angels. And they placed the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from Abinadab's house, which was on a hill. Uzzah and Ayo, Abinadab's sons, were guiding the cart that carried the ark of God, and Ayo walked in front of the ark. Okay, so press pause for a moment to understand this story and where it's going and what happens. We got to do some historical background on what's going on here. So what is that exactly is the ark of God? What is the ark of the covenant? What is that? Well, to put simply, the ark of the covenant was the most significant, sacred religious symbol of the uniqueness of Israel's relationship with God. Old Testament scholar John Golden Gay describes the ark this way. He says, the covenant chest stood for some realities at the heart of Israel's faith. It stood for the reality and the power of Yahweh. It stood for Yahweh's distinctiveness as the God who could not be imaged. It stood for Yahweh's entering into a special relationship with Israel. It stood for Yahweh's acting as Israel's deliverer from oppression and for Yahweh's presence. And it stood for the fact that Yahweh had expectations of Israel. And you notice that this comes from his book, Men Behaving Badly. <laughs> and it's a, it's a book, it's a commentary on First and Second Samuel that looks at the lives of Saul, David, and Solomon. Now, the ark was constructed following Yahweh's very specific instructions way back in the days of Moses. Inside the ark were the Ten Commandments. On top of the ark, under the angel's wings, was the mercy seat that would be sprinkled with sacrificial blood on the Day of Atonement. And again, the ark was the symbol of God's presence. It was the symbol of God's holiness. It was the symbol of God's grace. It was a symbol of Yahweh's special relationship with Israel and also the ark pointed to the person and work of the lamb that would someday come to take away the sins of the world. There was no more important religious object in the history of Israel than the ark, but it was more than a symbol. Look at verse two. Notice how the ark is described. The ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, who is enthroned above the cherubim. Now, I take that to mean that in some mysterious way, the actual manifest presence of God rested on the ark, as the picture attempts to show. When Yahweh was given Moses the plans for building the ark, he said, talking about the mercy seat, He said, there I will meet with you and from above the mercy seat between the two cherubim, I will speak with you. So the ark was not just some holy wooden box overlaid with gold. It was that because, and it was holy set apart because there was nothing like in all of Israel or really in the world, but it was holy because the Holy One of Israel set his presence over that box. The ark was Yahweh's throne. So the presence of God resided there, and whenever you have the presence, you have the power of God. Now, back in 1 Samuel, we read how the sons of Eli, uh, Hophni and Phinehas, treated the ark like some kind of rabbit's foot, a lucky charm, and they took it into into battle against the Philistines, who was Israel's sworn enemy, thinking that the ark would guarantee them victory in battle. Now, that's the premise of the movie, The Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? I mean, the Nazis want the ark because they believe that possessing it and carrying it into battle would help them win World War II. Now, there's a scene in the movie where Indy is explaining the ark's power to some government people, and he picks up an old Dutch Bible to explain the significance of the ark, and he shows them this picture. So the ark is striking down Israel's enemies, some kinds of beams or laser beams or whatever. But, but in the movie, the ark was viewed as a deadly weapon. Now, remember, that's how Hophni and Phinehas were thinking. They took the ark into battle 
thinking it would help them win the battle, but Israel lost the battle and the ark was taken by the Philistines. It was put on a cart and wheeled off to the city of Ashdod and placed in the Philistine, uh, uh, the God of the Philistines uh, temple, Dagon. And if you remember that story, Dagon kept falling down in front of the ark and he eventually broke into all kinds of pieces. And then all of a sudden, plagues started to break out in Philistia and people got sick and they were covered with boils and they had serious hemorrhoid problems. Yes, they had hemorrhoid problems. You can go back and listen to the second message in the first part of royalty, 1 Samuel 4 through 8, and you'll, you'll, you'll hear me explain that. But maybe you wouldn't want to do that. But anyway, um, so uh, this is no ordinary religious object. You're messing with Almighty God here, and no way was Almighty, Holy God of, of, of the universe going to let himself be used by anyone for their own advantage. So, so after the plagues and all these problems, the Philistines couldn't get that thing out of town fast enough. They loaded it on a cart and sent it to, back to Israel to the village of Beth Shemesh. And it was unloaded off the cart by Levitical priests and sacrifices were offered to celebrate the ark coming back to Israel. But some men's curiosity got the best of them. They looked inside the ark, which was forbidden in the law of Moses, their faces didn't melt off like in the movie, but Yahweh struck down 70 men, which of course sent shock waves blowing through the whole uh, community. And the people said, and I quote, who is able to stand before the Lord, the holy God? We gotta get this thing out of here. So some other guys came and took the ark to the house of a man named Abinadab, who lived way up on a hill, way out of town. And it was guarded by his two sons, Uzzah, and Ayo, and it remained there all but forgotten for about 50 years. The previous king, King Saul, never had any desire to bring the ark back into the center of life and worship of God, God's people because it was too dangerous. It just wasn't safe. Now, David has become king, and like Jim talked about last week, the first thing that David did was to uh, establish a new capital, a new capital city, Jerusalem, Mount Zion, and uh, after establishing military and political power in Israel, now David wants to bring the manifest presence of God back into the national life of God's people by bringing the ark of God into his capital city, the city of David. David loves Yahweh. He knows how far the nation has drifted from true heartfelt worship, and he wants to correct that, and by by bringing the ark to Jerusalem, David knows that and believes that once again, Yahweh would dwell among his people. And once again, the people would know the presence of God and the holiness of God and the grace of God and all Israel would be united worshiping Yahweh. And it looks like David's got it right. Looks like he's doing a wonderful thing. I can't imagine anybody being more sincere than David here. But, push pause, I want to give you a principle that you can put on your refrigerator, or you might cross-stitch it and put it on your wall. It's up to you. Here's the principle. You can be sincere, but you can be sincerely wrong. You can be sincere, but you can be sincerely wrong. Now, hold that thought. And let's go forward. Look at verse five. David and all the people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments, guitars and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. This is a huge parade, a huge parade with an Old Testament marching band. And all these people were filled with joy. They're celebrating the ark coming into Jerusalem. Again, meaning they're celebrating the presence of God coming back to Israel to dwell among his people. And the, ox, uh, the ark is, uh, is on a cart pulled by oxen. Now, you don't drive uh, an ox cart like you do a stagecoach. Not that any of you have ever driven a stagecoach, I would imagine, but you've seen the westerns. But when oxen are pulling a wagon, one man walks in front of the oxen, that's Ayo, and another man walks alongside, that's Uzzah, but you don't drive the animals, you guide them. And it's an amazing 
wonder-filled moment, and you think that this celebration is just going to go on and on. It's going to crescendo as the as the everybody comes marching into town. It's going to be great. But then you hit verses six and seven. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled. And Uzzah, walking alongside, reached out his hand and steadied the ark of God. But the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him dead because of this. So Uzzah died right there on the spot beside the ark of God. And you're like, whoa, what? What? What would you, uh, he, he just reached out his hand to steady the ark and God strikes him dead? Like, okay, put yourself in this scene. Put yourself in this scene. Everybody's singing at the top of their lungs. Some are playing trumpets and clarinets and trombones and saxophones and snare drums and cymbals. Some are dancing. You gotta get the scene in your mind. Imagine this, everybody's happy. Uzzah was singing God's praises. All of a sudden, though, the ox stumbles and Uzzah walking alongside, he sees the ark kind of rock back and forth. He's, it's, it's just instinctive. It's well-meaning. He did what any of us would do. He put his hand up to steady it, pow, dead on the spot. And, and imagine the shock waves going through the crowd. Imagine the deadly silence. Imagine everybody grinding to a halt. The trombone players just walked right into the back of the trumpet players. I mean, everybody's just staring. Imagine, all of a sudden, people start weeping. People start shrieking and screaming. A few get hysterical and completely lose it. People start to back away. 30,000 people praising God, singing and dancing, the band's playing. Here's Uzza and Ayo, the two drum majors. They're very excited, full of devotion, and all Uzza does is put his hand up to steady the ark, and he's dead. I'm telling you, this is one of those passages where you're tempted to say, and I'm gonna say it because we need to be honest, but this is one of those passages where you're tempted to say, is this really who God is? Is this really what he's like? Now check your feelings. How are you feeling right now? Confused? Angry, afraid. I mean, what is going on here? Now, whatever you're feeling trying to process this, you need to know that David is feeling the same thing, but of course, a hundred times, it's a hundred times worse for him because he's standing right there. He's experienced all of this, watching the whole thing. Look at verse eight. David was angry because the Lord's anger had burst out against Uzzah, and he named that place Perez Uzzah, which means to burst out against Uzzah, as it is still called today. David was now afraid of the Lord, and he asked, how can I ever bring the ark of the Lord back into my care? He's asking, how can I possibly be up close and personal with a God like this? Verse 10, he's angry, he's afraid, so he decides not to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath, and the ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. David's angry. He's afraid to bring the ark into the city of David, and it ends up again in a private home. He's thinking the same thing as the men in Beth Shemesh in 1 Samuel 6, who is able to stand before Yahweh, the holy God. Oh yeah, he's angry. He's angry with God. He's brought God into the court of his own judgment and he's judged him as unworthy. He's like, if this is what happens, if this is what might happen, I'm done. I'm not taking the ark any any further. He's, He's thinking God's not safe enough for me to bring him into my city. And he's angry, he's afraid, he's confused. He can't make what just happened fit with who he previously thought God to be. What's going on? Okay, remember the principle from earlier. You can be sincere but be sincerely wrong. Stay with me. Again, the ark was more than a religious relic. 
It was more than a symbol of the presence of God. It bore the manifest presence of God in a very real way. Yeah, God was enthroned above the mercy seat between the two angels. So to treat the ark as unholy is to treat Yahweh as unholy. To treat the ark as unholy is to treat Yahweh as unholy. You see, this passage which seems to be about a senseless death, and it is about that. But this passage is actually a case study of the holiness of God. It's actually a case study of the holiness of God. Now, hear me. You are here today, whether you understand this or not, to worship a God who's absolutely holy in everything he does. He is uncompromising in his holiness. He is zealous for his holiness. He is holy in his holiness. And for David and the Israelites, again, to treat the ark as unholy was to treat Yahweh as unholy. So, so, so how could they be treating the ark as unholy? By not treating and transporting the ark the way that God had instructed them in the law. You see, God was very specific about the way the ark was to be treated and transported. It was all spelled out in detail in the Mosaic Law. The ark was constructed with rings on the four corners through which poles could be inserted so it could be carried on the shoulder of the Levitical priests. So only Levitical priests could transport the ark, had to be carried on their shoulders, not on a wagon. In ancient Israel, the ark resided in a tent in the Holy of Holies. Only a Levitical priest could see the ark. Ordinary people were never allowed to see it, and that's why those 70 men in Beth Shemesh were struck dead. Their sneak peek treated the ark and Yahweh as unholy. And that meant that when the ark was transported, it had to be covered, and you can read about that in Numbers chapter four. It was covered with a big blue cloth, but here, there's no mention of the ark being covered. So David, in the midst of doing something that appears to be good, he's actually desecrating the very thing that he's transporting. He's treating the ark as unholy and therefore treating God as unholy. Why? Again, because he's not following God's specific instructions as to how to handle the ark. Think about it. Where did he get the idea of placing the ark on a cart? not from God's word, not from wise, the wise counsel of the priest. No, he was copying the Philistine plan of transporting the ark on a cart, which, as you recall, turned out to be a disaster. So think about this. Uzzah was trying to do what he thought was the right thing. David was trying to do what he thought was the right thing. All those Israelites thought that they were doing the right thing, but they all, and they all sincerely believed they were doing what God Wanted, but they were sincerely wrong. Now, here's my big idea. The amazing revelation of Scripture is that the God of the universe wants to live with us in an up-close, personal relationship. That's what the ark was all about. It was about God being in the midst of his people. That was that was an act of grace. God was seeking fellowship with his people. But that doesn't mean that we can treat him any way we want. God is holy, and that means we must never treat him with anything less than the respect he rightly deserves. We have to relate to him as he instructs us in his word. And to not relate to him as his word instructs, and even to be ignorant of what his word instructs, which is exactly what's going on in this story, that's to treat him as unholy. Now, a lot of people today will say things like, well, I just believe that if you're sincere about what you believe, God will accept that. Uh, think about this story here. Is that true? No, many, many people who love God say things like, well, you know, things just weren't working out for me in my marriage, and I wonder what the Bible says about marriage and divorce and all that, but I just believe God wants me happy, and I'm not happy, so my, I think, you know, basically God wants me happy, so I'm, I'm just going to leave. Now, I'm not talking about, uh, I'm not talking about 
Um, there, are, there are biblical grounds for divorce, that kind of thing. I'm not talking about staying in an abusive situation. I'm talking about people who just, oh, we're not compatible. I just want to be happy. To ignore what God says just to pursue personal happiness, that is to treat God as unholy. Many sincere Christians today being influenced by sincere leaders in the church who say that you can choose whatever identity you want based on your sexual attraction. But God says in his word that he is the one who chooses and determines our identity. We don't choose our identity. God gives us an identity. And not to accept that is to treat God as unholy. Now, I hear you. You're you're saying, well, what does holy even mean? I'm not sure I even understand. It's like a big church word, but I'm not sure. That's a great question. When we talk about the holiness of God or we say that God is holy, we mean there is no one or no thing in all of heaven and earth that is like him. He is like no other. He is in all, above all, and over all. It means that God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways and thoughts higher than ours. And that means that he and he alone has the right to define good and evil and right and wrong. Holy means as almighty God, as our creator and redeemer, he and he alone has the right to define and determine how life is to be lived in relationship with him. You see in this, this, the, the point is that our holy God wants to live among us. He wants to live up close and personal with us, but that doesn't mean you can just treat him however you want. You gotta come to him and relate to him according to his word. Now, let's push rewind. Let's go back to the story. I'm about to say something that might shock you, but this is so important. This moment of tragedy is also an awesome moment of grace. You see, God knew what was going on in Israel. The nation had drifted away from the true worship of God. They had become deeply enculturated by the surrounding nations to the extent that they were giving their heart to the worship of their idols. And you you might remember that the previous king, King Saul, was consulting a witch to try to determine what he was supposed to do as king. God knew something about Israel, but he knew something about David as well. Even David's heart had drifted. David was chosen to be chosen by God to be king over God's people Israel, but as king, he had become quite comfortable with polyamory, with being a polygamist, which was in direct disobedience to God's command. So as crazy as this may sound, What we're reading here about the holiness of God is how a a loving holy God was calling his people back to himself in order to have fellowship with them, that up-close personal relationship, and to bring his people back to real, uh, consistent, scripture-based, heartfelt worship. Now, you see, every one of us in this room, we all have a problem, and it's the same problem. And it's not unlike David's problem, and that is your heart and my heart are prone to wander. You remember the old hymn, Oh to Grace, How Great a Debtor, Daily I'm Constrained to Be? Let that grace now, like a fetter, chain my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for the courts above. Because we have wandering hearts, because we're all, off, um, all, all of us are often more attractive to our way of doing things than God's way, because we are tempted to tend to bend the rules or bend the truth, because we sometimes step outside of God's loving boundaries, because we even do God things, our way, the holiness of God is our hope. God's holiness is our hope. Our hope, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, God in his holiness is serious about 
your sin. In holiness, God is absolutely driven to rescue you and me from you and me. Paul Tripp puts it this way, your greatest problem in all of life exists inside of you, not outside of you. Deep inside, as I said, we're all prone prone to wonder. I, I wanna write my own story. I wanna adjust the plot lines of my life how I see fit. I wanna make up my own rules. I wanna serve my own kingdom. I want things to go my way. And your heavenly Father, your loving, holy heavenly Father, wants to save you and save me from all of that. Think about it, if you're a father or a mother, you know how this works. A wise parent gives their child instruction. And when they give a child a do this, don't do that uh, command, it's for their own good. And if that parent actually loves their child, they will not compromise that command. They will not be worn down. They will not just give up and say, okay, just do whatever you want. If I mean, if a parent ultimately knows what's best for their children, but lets them do whatever they want, that means that parent doesn't really love the child. Hebrews 12 uh, says that God is our holy father and he disciplines us to produce in us a, a harvest of righteousness and peace. His discipline, his correction, listen, his saying, no, I'm telling you, you won't find the life Jesus died to give you by living in the sin he died to save you from. That's for our good. You don't want to serve a God who will let you do anything you want. You want to serve an uncompromisingly holy God who will draw you back to himself again and again and again. You don't want a God who will let you do whatever you want. You want a heavenly father who will say, no, I, I love you too much to let you go down that road. God's refusal to compromise compromise his own instructions are in itself an act of grace because there's nothing I need more than to be saved from my own prone to wandering heart. I'm just gonna be honest with you. I, I know this is probably hard for you to believe, but I can be selfish. I can be so impatient. I can be so unkind. I can be so proud I can be such a demanding self-sovereign and I need a holy God that says, no, that's not where you're gonna find life. So this story is not a moment of divine failure. It's a moment of God's persevering grace, not allowing people to violate his holiness because it's not for their good, ultimate good to do. Do that. He is shocking his people with the needed realization of the depth of their disloyalty, the depth of their rebellion, the depth of their ignorance, and he's calling them back into a relationship with himself that's up close and personal, but they have to come to him his way. And David comes to understand this. David comes to understand. He's angry now with God. He's afraid of God. He didn't want to take the risk of bringing the ark of God into Jerusalem, so he sends it to the home of a man named Obed-Edom who lived in Gath. Who else was from Gath? Who did David defeat? Goliath was from Gath. David sends the ark back to the Philistines. Now, unless you think this is a gracious gesture on his part, This would be like dumping toxic waste in somebody's backyard, (laughs) as far as the Philistines are concerned. But the the amazing good news is that God blesses the household of Obed-Edom, probably meaning that he harvested more grain. His daughters and his daughters-in-law were more fertile. His business opportunities skyrocket, things like that that were abundantly observable to people. And David hears about it. And so after three months, David wants to give it another time. Try. This time, though, he does his due diligence. He prepares a place for the ark and pitched a tent for it. He said that no one except the Levites could carry the ark. And when he appointed Levites to carry the ark, this is what he told them. Now, this comes from the parallel account of this story in 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles 15, David says to these Levites, you are the leader of, leaders of the Levite families. You must purify yourself and all your fellow Levites 
So you can bring the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I've prepared for it. Now look at this. Because you Levites did not carry the ark the first time, the anger of the Lord our God burst out against us. Not simply Uzzah, but us. We failed to ask God how to move it properly. So the priests and the Levites purified themselves in order to bring the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to Jerusalem. Then the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with its carrying pole, just as the Lord had instructed Moses. So you see, David sees how he got it wrong. The first time, there's no mention that he consulted the Lord about any of this. Obviously, this time he does. And he realizes that by not following God's instructions about how to treat and transport the ark, he had brought disaster on himself, the people, and poor Uzzah. You said, well, this, I mean, to teach everybody a lesson, this isn't fair to Uzzah. I get that. But here's the deal. Sometimes the failures of a leader have hurtful consequences to an innocent follower. When our leaders send people in battle, people die. David's carelessness as a leader cost people their lives. And this is the second time that he's done this. Back to 2 Samuel 6, 12. So David went and brought the ark from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with great celebration. And after the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and blowing ram's horn. So you see what's happening here. The story seems to end on a high note. Everything is now in line with God's word. The priests are carrying the ark on poles on their shoulders. No cart this time. It is a great celebration. Now, I want to come back to this story. We're not done with it, but just the story doesn't end on a high note. Because as you read on, you find that as the ark comes to Jerusalem, David goes all out. I mean, he's dancing half naked before the Lord and his wife, Michael, the former King Saul's daughter, despises him for it and she tells him about it. And they get into a big fight and David reminds her that God chose him as king over her father. And uh, then you read on after the fight, she never has children. Now, it doesn't say that Yahweh caused that. But presumably, David never had relationships with her again, which means that none of David's children had Saul's blood in them. The bloodline of David is now David's bloodline, not some combo bloodline of Saul and David, which God made clear that that would not ever be the case. That's how the story ends on a minor key. But let's go back. Let's go back to what we're talking about. Again, big idea. The the amazing revelation of Scripture is that the holy God of the universe wants to live up close and personal with us, but that doesn't mean that we can just treat him any way that we want. He's holy. That means we have to treat him with the respect that he rightfully deserves, and we got to relate to him as he instructs us in his word. To respect God's holiness, to treat him as holy, We have to come to him as his word instructs. We have to relate to him as his word instructs us to relate. To think that we can come any way we want, to think that we can relate to him any way we want, thinking that all that matters is that we're sincere, that's to treat him unholy. So let me ask you one more time. What kind of God do you really want? Be honest. Do you you want a God that just endorses your plan for your life, even if he knows it's not the best plan? Do you want a God who just lets you make up your own rules, a God who willingly compromises what he knows is best in order for you uh, to pursue, to let you pursue what you think will bring you your own happiness? Do you want a God who will let you wander into messes of your own making? Or do you want a God who in gracious holiness says, no, that's not, that's not what I want for you. 
And those are the kinds of questions that the what's up with us a story forces us to think about. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let me end on some really good news. We're going to fast forward now 400 years. And Yahweh is talking, uh, speaking with Jeremiah, the prophet. And he is talking about how, and Jeremiah is writing, he's addressing uh, God's backslidden, enslaved people. And he's painting a picture of a time in the future where the manifest presence of the Lord no longer resides in the ark. Listen, Yahweh says, and when your land is once more filled with people, says the Lord, you will no longer wish for the good old days when you possess the ark of the Lord's covenant. You will not miss those days or even remember them, and there will be no need to rebuild the ark. In that day, Jerusalem will be known as the throne of the Lord, and all the nations will come there to honor the Lord, and there will no longer stubbornly follow their own evil desires. In those days, the people of Judah and Israel will return together from exile in the north, and they will return to the land I gave your ancestors as an inheritance forever. A time when the ark is no more, a time when a holy God is up close and personal with his people without the ark, what changes all of that? I mean, how is it possible that the times of rules and rituals and relics are no longer needed to sustain a relationship with God? Well, everything changes because on the cross, the holiness of God and the grace of God meet and kiss in Jesus. In the Old Testament, God's uncompromising holiness demands that sin must be punished. But also in the Old Testament, God's holy love and grace provided an acceptable sacrifice for sin, the blood sprinkled on the mercy seat, ensuring God's continued presence among his people. But all that changed when Jesus came. Jesus came from heaven to earth And in him, the manifest presence of God walked among us. 1 John chapter 1, verse 14 talks about that. And then on the cross, Jesus became the mercy seat for us. On the cross, God's holiness and grace meet to offer us forgiveness and life. And to make it, listen, and to make it possible for the manifest presence of God to live inside us. And that is your hope when you put your faith and trust in Christ. Let's pray. take a moment and think has God brought something to your attention this morning if so just take a minute and talk to him about that Holy Father, thank you for this uh, shocking passage. Sometimes I think we, we just domesticate you. We treat you casually. We don't really treat you as the holy, loving, gracious God that you are. And for that, we ask your forgiveness. Thank you for how this passage exposes our hearts, but more importantly, thank you for how it points us to Jesus. For it's in his name we pray, amen.